special relativity, which is Einstein's uh, examination of what happens when objects travel really, really fast. And uh, we would be using Newton's laws normally to explain motion, but what Einstein uh, and some scientists discovered at the end of the uh, 19th century is that when things started to move really quickly, uh, Newton's laws didn't work anymore. If uh, Newton's laws um, aren't working when things move really fast, why is that? What was the thinking behind uh, Einstein's explanation uh, that kind of led to this conclusion? So essentially, we're just going to start off with um, Einstein's two postulates and uh, then we'll kind of explore some of those ideas a bit more. So essentially the, the two postulates or two key ideas for Einstein uh, were that um, the laws of physics remain the same in an inertial reference frame. Okay, so this one we we need to understand first of all what a reference frame is and that's uh, the particular environment that you're in uh, that you are comparing your motion to. So when we talk about relativity we're talking about uh, motion that is relative to your current uh, situation or your current movement. So Einstein's special relativity kind of looks at this special case when things are moving really, really quickly. But we just need to clarify that we're talking about an inertial reference frame. So an inertial reference frame is a frame of reference which is moving at a constant velocity. So it's not undergoing acceleration. So uh, if you were in a, a spaceship traveling through distant space, then it would be an inertial reference frame if its velocity, in other words, its speed and direction are remaining constant. So that's what an inertial reference frame is. Second postulate was that the speed of light remains constant uh, regardless of your reference frame. Now, that kind of rolls off the tongue and we kind of, we've got some idea of the speed of light hopefully already. We know that the speed of light is given the symbol small c and it has a value of 3 times 10 to the power of 8 metres per second. But when you consider that concept a little bit more deeply, what you um, start to realise is that's actually quite a remarkable statement. No matter what your reference frame is, the speed of light will remain constant. So uh, remember the example of uh, a car driving past and something's dropped out of the window of the car and if you're traveling along with the car, you'll just see the object kind of fall straight down. But if you're outside of the car and you're seeing the car go past like that, and something's dropped out of the window, you won't see it drop straight down to the ground. You'll actually see it moving with the car and then beginning to fall. So it'll actually have, a, well, we know it to be a parabolic shape. Um, so depending on the frame of reference that you're in, whether you're in the car or outside of the car, you'll actually see uh, a different result. So when we say that the speed of light is constant no matter what the reference frame is, that's actually pretty surprising. Um, so let's explore uh, that a little bit more. So in uh, about 18, um, 80s, 1887, Michelson Morley uh, were famous for one of the most failed, the greatest failed experiment in physics probably in all time. Um, but the result they got, and it was repeated um, 
numerous times, even currently to this day, this experiment has been repeated to verify the results. The results they got were so surprising that it really unraveled the whole of physics. Um, it was essentially this second postulate of Einstein, that the speed of light remains constant. And I, want, I don't want to go into uh, the, um, the experiment in too much detail. There's, there's um, a very interesting article on Wikipedia you can look up about the Marcus and Morley experiment. But essentially, they uh, built what's called an interferometer. So the Marcus and Morley experiment essentially was a light source was sending a, a light beam up to this special um, half sealed mirror they call it so part of the light went through up to a mirror here and part of the light got reflected at 90 degrees out to this mirror here and then the two light beams would reflect back and meet in the middle and because this whole experiment was moving along with the rotation of the Earth around the Sun, they were expecting that the light beam, let's say the whole Earth is moving this way, they were expecting that the light beam moving this way would be affected by the motion of the Earth, a bit like the cup coming out of the car. And so what they were expecting to see is that the two light beams would not um, reach this central spot at the same time. They, the one travelling with would uh, take longer to get back if you like. So the results of this experiment were that it doesn't matter whether the light was travelling this way or this way, it was unaffected by the motion of the Earth. In other words, the speed of light remained constant whether it was moving this way or whether it was moving this way. And this was a very, very startling result. And scientists, um, including Einstein, but before him Lorentz and others, were trying to kind of come up with ways to explain this conclusion. And it was really, really, uh, it shook the foundations of physics. Um, so, to explain the dilemma, we need to consider Einstein's idea of what he called a light clock. So, a light clock essentially is a box And at one end, the top end, there's a mirror. And at the bottom end, there's a light source and a detector. And very simply, the light goes up towards the mirror from the light source. And back down to the detector. So this is the source. And that's the detector. Now, what I want you to imagine is that this whole box is now moving. It's in an inertial reference frame and it's moving through space. Now, if you're inside the box, so imagine a little person inside the box here. And you're kind of watching the experiment, but you're moving along with the whole light clock, if you like. What you're going to see is that the light beam will go straight up and straight back down. And it will travel uh, a distance D. which is the heart of the box, and then back down again. So all, overall, it will travel a distance of 2D. If we wanted to try to find out how fast the light was going, we would just do velocity equals distance, which is 2D, over time, 
let's call it time one. Okay? Now, what I want you to imagine now is that you are coming out of that reference frame, so you're no longer inside the box, you are outside the box watching it go past. Alright? So this is inside the box, and this one is outside the box. Now, what happens here is that the, the person is watching here and they will see the light box, the light clock, moving past them. Right? So it's moving this way. But of course, as the light beam is emitted from the source, the whole source is moving past. So you kind of get this situation. So the light beam, you know, a few moments later when it reaches the mirror at the top, it's travelled that far. And then it will be reflected off the mirror and come back down to the detector. And so you'll see the situation happening like that. Now, if we want to find the speed of light in the second situation, so you are um, outside of the, the light clock, then the speed is going to be equal to the distance divided by the time. But let's call the distance h here. And you can see that H is actually longer than D. Okay? So it's travelled further. From this perspective, it looks like it's travelled further. So the total distance will be 2H divided by, let's call it T2. Now, here comes a dilemma. If this is true, And what Marxism Morley proved was true. Right. The speed of light is the same in all reference frames. Then these two calculations have to give the same result. This has to equal C and this has to equal C. Now, if you've changed the distance, the only way that can be true is if time one and time two are not the same. You need a bigger time here in order that you get the same answer, the same value for the speed of light. So time one does not equal time two. Again, just kind of rolls off the tongue. But let's think about that for a minute. Depending on where you're looking at an event from, so you've got some starting event here and some ending event here, depending on where you're looking at it from will change the time that that event has occurred from. It will change the time that the event has occurred for. So that's pretty weird, isn't it? That time could change depending on where you're looking at it from. So up until this point in physics, time had been understood to be absolute. You can't mess with time. The clock ticks at a certain rate and that's it. It doesn't matter if you're moving, sitting down in your chair, in an aeroplane, it doesn't matter. Time was thought to be fixed. This experiment and this explanation of Einstein um, basically shattered that understanding. And 
Um, there is a proof, it's on page 135 of your textbook, which connects these two numbers. In other words, we can calculate, if we know the, the um, speed that the clock's travelling at, then we know this distance, we can actually uh, work out a connection between these two uh, times. And this was Einstein's famous formula. Uh, not the e equals mc squared one, um, but the one for special relativity. So let's just uh, look at that. The proof of it is not required for this course, um, but it's in the workbook if you want to have a look at it. But essentially the conclusion was this. I'm going to redefine time one and time two, um, and I'm going to define time one as being the proper time. Now, to understand proper time, you have to uh, think about where the starting event and the finishing event have occurred in the same place. So what do I mean by that? Well, this person here, inside the travelling light clock, will see the light beam coming back to the same spot that it started from. So uh, the starting event and the ending event have occurred in the same place. Okay? If that's happening, then that is the time in this reference frame is referred to as proper time T0. Okay? Now the other time is what we call the dilated time. Dilated, if you talk about the pupils in your eye, if the if you get a bright light, your pupils close down. If it's dark, your pupils dilate, they change. So in the other frame of reference, the time has changed and we just call this T, which is the dilated time. And just to finish with, the relationship between the proper time and the dilated time can be uh, written as follows. So the dilated time is equal to a constant which we call gamma times by the proper time. So if the proper time is two seconds, we multiply it by this factor here and we'll get the new time in the dilated frame of reference, the dilated time. Now gamma is equal to, and this is the proof that's not required, but gamma is equal to um, 1 divided by the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared, where v is the, the speed of uh, the, the frame of reference. Okay, so that V is not the same as that V over there, but this is the speed that the frame of reference is moving at. So this speed here is uh, the, the V in this formula, the speed of the light clock. Now gamma is also referred to as the, the Lorentz factor because Lorentz uh, scientists in the late 19th century had also done some thinking about the Marx and Morley experiment and uh, he actually was the first to come up with this formula. Thanks for watching guys. If you've got any questions please load them up to Daymap and uh, we'll see you online. Okay, thanks. Bye.